of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome everybody again to another episode of our show, bringing you another fascinating guest today involved in creating a better tomorrow uh, for many people out there. Uh, today we have the uh, honor of being joined by Dr. Alejandro Dornbaum, who is the Chief Medical Officer uh, of Reneo Pharmaceuticals, which is a clinical stage pharmaceutical company. They're focused on the development of therapies uh, for patients with rare genetic diseases, uh, including mitochondrial diseases uh, with significant unmet medical need. Uh, previously uh, to Reneo, Dr. Dornbaum was the Chief Medical Officer at, at Alacos, where uh, he achieved proof of concept concept in clinical trials for uh, novel therapeutic antibodies uh, targeting inflammatory cells. Uh, he's also served as chief medical officer at Lumina Pharmaceuticals, uh, which was acquired by Shire. Uh, and prior to that, worked at Genentech, responsible for uh, various respiratory programs in the area of asthma, cystic fibrosis, also at uh, Biomarin Pharmaceutical, conducting clinical development uh, of, of Kuvan, uh, began his career at Chiron, uh, gaining broad expertise in, the, in several areas of drug development, including biologics, vaccines, and small molecules. Um, Dr. Dorbaum received his uh, medical degree from the National Autonomous University of Mexico City, completed his residency in pediatrics at University of Texas uh, Health Science Center, did a fellowship in allergy and immunology at uh, Baylor College of Medicine, and maintains active uh, academic positions as a clinical professor of pediatrics uh, at Stanford School of Medicine, specializing uh, in allergy and immunology. Uh, we're honored to have him with us today. A lot of interesting themes to get into today. Uh, Dr. Alejandro Dorenbaum, welcome to our show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It, it's great having you. Um, a lot of very unique themes that we have not touched on uh, that I'm looking forward to getting into today. But um, as typical, I, you know, I would like to start off, as we usually do, uh, by handing you the mic for a little bit, just to uh, talk a little bit more about you and sort of the beginnings of this journey you've been on. I, I noticed in the uh, in the peer-reviewed literature, you did an exceptional amount of work early on in your career in, in uh, HIV, pediatric HIV, uh, maternal to child transmission of HIV. Uh, take us back to the early days, if you would, and the, sort of the beginning of your story, because it is quite uh, varied and interesting. Sure, sure. So, so as you, as as you mentioned, I, I I was born and raised in Mexico City, and I went through medical school in Mexico, and um, I, I and uh, you know throughout my 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 medical school, I was reading these books and these these papers that talked about how to treat patients, but uh, I was learning medicine in an environment of not as many resources as we have here in the U.S. And and I, I thought that I, I really, you know, I felt that in I was there were really amazing physicians in Mexico that are able to treat patients really well, but but the lack of resources that existed there was something that I was preoccupied with, and I said, you know, I want to really learn how 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 so to speak how how to play in the big leagues where, where all resources are available to help patients to the, to the best of our ability. And, and that's why I pursued coming to the U.S. and do a, a further training. Uh, and I did my residency in pediatrics and then allergy and immunology. I can say this. I can say that I made all the right decisions for all the wrong reasons, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in my life. I, 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 I studied medicine initially because uh, uh, I was... Uh, 
influenced by my brother that studied medicine before me and he was having a lot of fun studying medicine so i thought i just want to have as much fun as he is and in, never imagined that i would fall in love with medicine as much as i did early on you know i i really didn't go into medicine thinking i have a call into medicine i went into medicine because i saw that as something that could be fun to do because my brother was doing it <laughs> but it turns out that uh, i think that I have stuck to medicine more than my brother, and I, I, I've enjoyed this journey tremendously. It's been a unique opportunity for me. Mm -hmm. And and in you know my training in allergy and immunology was very interesting. I was doing a rotation in allergy and immunology during my residency training program in pediatrics. I thought I was going to do infectious diseases, but I needed to understand how infections interact with the immune system in humans. Yep. So I organized a rotation in immunology. And when I did the rotation in immunology, the professor that I was working with said to me, Alex, I've never met someone who is so passionate about immunology as you are. You should be doing immunology. You shouldn't be doing infectious diseases. And um, you know, in thinking about it, I said to my wife, you know, if someone sees something in you that much and he's so focused on telling you this is what you should be doing I, I should pay attention to it because you know I, I wasn't aware that I would like immunology as much as I did and that was around the time when the HIV epidemic was exploding in the US you know I did my, my training in the 80s so so in fact I think that when I began my residency training, we were not talking about HIV at all. And when I finished three years later, my residency training, that was a main problem in the United States. And, and um, I, I had, you know, the opportunity to learn how to do research in, 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 in clinical studies and start working in, in HIV during my fellowship in allergy and immunology. And um, it became clear that that was a major problem in the United States. And one of the areas that I'm really proud of is, is, is having worked in that work to prevent transmission of the HIV to, from mother to infant. Because when I was doing that, HIV was the fourth leading cause of death in children yep. in the United States. And by just preventing the transmission of the virus from the mothers to the babies, we were able to reduce that to almost zero. So, so that kind of work that I, I participated in, I was young, so I was not the leading author in the, or, or, or thinker in that area, but, 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 but I got very early involved in that. And I actually, I think I chaired, I was chair of one of the, the largest clinical trials ever done in women to stop transmission to babies. We enrolled mm -hmm. 1700 women in yeah. multiple countries. And we really brought the transmission. In those days, the transmission rate was about 25% and it came down to about 2%. And now it's, it's zero. So, so that really changed the health of children, in not only in the US, but throughout the world. So that, that by itself, I could have retired there and say, hey, <laughs> I did my job. That's it. I don't need to do anything else. <laughs> but... You know, once you have success in one of those projects, you want to have success again and again and again. Yeah. And um, and uh, and uh, 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 at one time in my career, uh, I, I I I thought that I could be more effective if I were to implement my research abilities in the setting of of industry rather than academia. So I transitioned out of the university and I went to work to Chiron. Uh, at that time, uh, and from Chiron, uh, I realized that I, 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 I was not that interested in my life in studying um, uh, diseases for which there were already cures and where you were trying to find something else to do with the patient so that you can have a good, you, you know, commercial program. I, I, I realized that's important. I think, you know, if you think about cholesterol medicines you know the first few cholesterol mm -hmm. medicines that came out were not very good and the ones we have today i mean recently there are there are cholesterol medicines that you give a shot to a person and and the cholesterol stays low for months i mean yep. that is an amazing outcome uh, so so the fact that people have continued to research in an area where there were already good medicines but you can do even better medicines that's amazing 
But that's never been my interest. My interest has been trying to help patients uh, 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 for whom big industry has not been interested in, in pursuing, in, in rare, difficult to treat orphan diseases. And, um, and I think that has to do with my training. My training was in pediatrics and in rare diseases that happen to children. So I kind of got into that and, and that, that has always been my interest. And th there are several complexities in, in, in studying these patients. First, okay. you know, we know a lot about diabetes because there are about 20 million diabetics in the United States. And we know about a hypertension because there are even more millions of hypertensive people in the United States. But when it comes to these rare diseases, we don't have a full understanding of the diseases. So it's very difficult to tackle them because, you know, you don't have a very good understanding of what might or might not happen to these patients if you treat them or if you just follow them for a period of time. So the natural history of the disease, how, how the disease evolves over time in different various populations, in a larger population is not well understood. That creates some complexity in the development of, the, of, of a drug program for these patients. Second, the typical development program of a project in, in, in pharma, you know, we have heard about phase one trials, phase two trials, phase three trials. In phase one, you just, you know, look at the safety of the drug and how well absorbed the drug can be, how much exposure can you get with the drug in the body. In phase two, you kind of evaluate a proof of concept, can I, can, I, can I change the disease in some way in these patients? And if I change it, how much does it change? And then in phase three, you just do the larger clinical trial where you demonstrate the, F, the safety and the efficacy and the long-term exposure to the drug. Well, you can do that when you have millions of patients or thousands of patients that can participate in clinical trials. But when you're dealing with small populations of patients, it's very difficult to do that because if you do it, the patients that participate in phase one or phase two may not be able to participate in phase three and you may not have enough patients with the right characteristics to enter into the trial. So you're very limited on the early phase exploration that you can do in these patients in order to do the phase three trial. And once you go to the phase three trial, you may not be able to enroll as many patients as you wish to be able to demonstrate that the drug works. Another complicated matter is the endpoints. The endpoints in the rare diseases are not well established. You know, right. everyone knows that if you're doing a study for hypertension, all you need to prove is that the blood pressure drops by five millimeters of mercurium, and then you get it. You know, it's the approval. Or in diabetes, you just drop the sugar enough, and that's it. You measure it. It's very simple. Or, or even in cancer, the endpoints are better defined, you know. Can you shrink the tumor X percentage or can you be free of diseases for X number of months? Or, you know, they have very clear endpoints. But how do you deal with a patient with a rare metabolic disease like a mitochondrial myopathy where patients can present with fatigue, they can present with blindness, with hearing loss, with uh, liver disease, with gastrointestinal symptoms, with cardiomyopathy, all of those problems happen in these patients. So, so, and not every patient has all of these problems. So what do you focus on? How do you choose what to study? And not only that, sometimes what you want to study is not necessarily what the patients care about or what the regulatory agencies like the FDA care about. So for example, if you ask patients what, with PMM, with primary mitochondrial myopathy, what bothers them most? They will tell you universally that the fatigue and the difficulty in completing activities of daily living is what bothers them the most. They are in a state of constant fatigue and difficulty moving just to do the simple things that you and I take for granted. Uh, but, but, you know, the FDA, cares about something objective that you can measure. The FDA wants you to demonstrate very specifically, you know, that you can improve how a patient feels, functions, or survives. And in the feeling, it's not enough that you say, hey, I feel much better with this medicine. You have to complete these questionnaires where you get evaluated 
to see if your feelings are improving or not in a very specific way. And that process is not an easy process because it requires what it's called a validation program. It, you know, you need to make sure that what the questions that you're asking the patient are, are A, questions that are relevant to the patient, mm -hmm. B, are understood by the patient, and C, mean something when they change to that patient. And doing that requires many patients and asking those questions many times in many different ways. And that's not easy to do in rare patient diseases that happen in rare in small numbers of patients or patients with rare diseases. Mm -hmm. So the challenges are great, but then also the success is amazing. You know, sometimes when you're able to get a drug through, and I've been lucky that that I've been involved in the approval of a couple of drugs in, in, in patients with rare diseases, when you make a difference for these patients, um, it, 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 it is an amazing uh, 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 opportunity. And I was, you know, when I was at Biomarine, for example, I was lucky that, 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 I, that I, I was given the opportunity to, to, to lead the project for, for instance, phenylketonuria. Yeah. And phenylketonuria is a very interesting disease, by the way, and, and we don't think about rare diseases. This is another important aspect. Sometimes rare diseases inform you on bigger things in life that people don't pay attention to. So people, people would ask the question, why should we invest so much money in understanding rare diseases if they are very rare? Why don't we just focus on the big diseases and help more people and forget about those rare diseases that you know they just affect a small number of patients? Well, sometimes rare diseases actually help you understand bigger things that will have an impact on everybody. And PKU is the best example of that. PKU yeah. is a really the best example. For example, PKU is the first disease for which there was a gene, specific gene identified for a monogenic gene transmission of the disease. So, uh, uh, but interestingly, what was learned with PKU, this is this disease PKU phenylketonuria, yeah. most people have heard, may have came come across PKU, but don't know it. If you take a diet, a, a, a diet coke and you look at the back of the diet coke you will see if phenylketonurics don't drink this drink yep. and this is because because diet coke has phenylalanine and patients with phenylketonuria cannot manage the phenylalanine well and yep. because they cannot manage it well it affects the brain and it can cause problems in the brain and in the very young babies, it can call, cause, if, if, if very young babies with PKU, if they eat phenylalanine, they will develop mental retardation. So at one point, eh, about half of the patients who were in mental hospitals had PKU because they had developmental retardation. And this was in the early, you know, 30s, 40s, and 50s. And then when people realized that these patients had phenylketonuria, and we stopped giving phenylalanine to the babies, they started doing much better. So, uh, so that is very interesting. So if you think about it, this is a disease where you are born with a problem, but if you change your behavior, you do better. Right. So, you know, if you have phenylketonuria and you don't change your behavior, you will have mental retardation. But if you have phenylketonuria and you avoid phenylalanine in your diet, you will grow without mental retardation. Yeah. Well, isn't that the same concept for cholesterol, for example, that you have the genes to have high cholesterol, but if you modify your diet and you exercise, you can prevent the complications of high cholesterol. And that's a concept that came, you know, people didn't know that if you're born with a risk, you can modify that risk by changing your behavior by just making an adjustment in your diet. That came from PKU. And then that we applied that to patients with cardiovascular disease, to patients with diabetes, to patients with all the big diseases that affect us currently in, in this world. The idea that you can change your diet and that will result in a better outcome in a disease, even a genetic disease where you have a defect that you cannot address. And 
that was an amazing concept that yeah. unique to phenylketonuria. So being able to work in phenylketonuria was a unique opportunity for me. And we found a drug that can improve the lives of patients with phenylketonuria. The drug is called Cuban. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and if you go back and look at the development program for Cuban, it was a pretty um, spectacular uh, development in which we made adaptations to be able to address the disease in a smaller number of patients and be able to come up with very solid results. And, and I think that that has been some one of the themes of my career. One of the themes of my career has been um, finding ways to develop drugs in patients with rare diseases where we can address all those difficulties that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought up PKU because, you know, and, and again, for everyone listening and watching, if you want to go look at Dr. Dornbaum's um, uh, PubMed sort of <laughs> citation list there. Um, yeah, I mean, that phase three study where you basically did everything that you were just talking about that's difficult. You know, you, you enrolled lots of people of various ages. You studied them for three years. I mean, it. it, it with a very tough condition. So, I mean, I think that, yeah, I mean, it's a perfect segue to why everything you're doing now at Reneo is, you know, right up your alley and that uh, whether we're talking about, you know, major unmet medical needs or these very complex um, orphan slash rare diseases, um, you know what you're doing. So I, I, I appreciate Alex, you giving that overview. So I, it, it, again, it feeds nicely into obviously everything you're doing now. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to, when it comes to Renee, I mean, I'd love to start off, obviously, just like, I guess a lot of people probably heard from high school biology or whatever about PKU. Obviously, many people listening will have heard of mitochondria, you know, we're taught the powerhouse of the cell, uh, and so forth and so on. Um, I would love to, if you could take us a little, you don't have to give us a lecture on that per se, but if you could talk a little bit about um, rare genetic mitochondrial disorders, because um, Obviously, you know, we, we have these mitochondria, there's, you know, thousands or whatever floating around each of our cells. They have their own genome, separate from the nuclear genome, but there is some right. communication there. And what you're focusing on, and, and if you could, again, take us, because this target of peroxisome proliferator activated receptor delta, which does a lot of stuff, and there's a great diagram on the Renéo website, uh, in terms of fatty acid and oxidation and ATP and all other types of things that are happening in the mitochondria and cytoplasm and nuclear membrane. Um, walk us a little through this target, because I think this is going to be important when we get into um, primary mitochondrial myopathies, the long chain fatty acid disorders and so forth. Take us take a little time and go through this one with this, if you would. Yeah. So, so when we were thinking about about Reneo, when when we came up with the idea of Reneo, they, they, by the way, this is not the first time we do it in this way. This is an interesting concept in developing a company to treat rare diseases. Yeah. Um, if you have a rare disease and if you understand the biology of the disease, you can try to tackle it by either making a new drug or uh, what we have done, and this is not the first time we did it with Lumina and with Mirum as well, right. uh, is by looking at what is out there that pharma, that big pharma has developed and that for business reasons they decided not to develop and, and that may potentially be adapted to the mechanism that you want to address in the population that you want to treat. And, and, and the advantage of doing that is that when big pharma develops a drug, they do all those big things that a small pharma cannot do. They, they do large phase one trials. They yep. really characterize the drug very well. They do all the toxicology studies that need to be done in animals. They do all the tests that need to be done to prepare a drug to be able to give that drug to humans. And that that is not an inconsequential process. That's a really large process. So yep. what we've done in several companies is we've looked at what uh, the, for example, the drug that we're dealing with is a drug that was initially developed to treat uh, cholesterol. Mm. But when Lipitor came on board, <laughs> it was much more effective. So what happened is the company said, hey, there is a much better solution to the problem. We're not going to continue to develop this drug anymore. And they put it in the shelf and they forgot about it. Yeah. And we, 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 we started thinking about, okay, 
we have these patients with PMM in whom the mitochondria don't work well. Is there any drug out there that we know affects how mitochondria function? And when we went and we started looking, you know, under the rug in all the different companies and look at what they had developed before and what programs they had abandoned. And we look at all the large pharma companies and we realized there is this P par delta agonist that was originally developed by Novo, a, a large diabetes company. Sure. And, and they put it in the shelf and they're not using it anymore. So we, we went to them and we said, hey, we'd like to buy that asset from you. And we'd like to be able to use it to treat patients with rare diseases with, with mitochondrial disease. Now, why did we choose the PPAR delta agonist? Well, so PPAR is a receptor mm -hmm. that sits near the nucleus of the cell. And when you stimulate PPAR, when you, when you give an agonist to increase the function of PPAR delta, what you have is activation of multiple genes. And all of these genes that are activated are genes that support mitochondrial function, support mm -hmm. the ability of mitochondria to generate more energy. And they also, there are genes that are activated that are involved in the reproduction, in the formation of new mitochondria. So we were very excited about this because we said, okay, we have these patients whose mitochondria are not functioning well. And maybe if we give them a drug that supports mitochondrial function and improves the reproduction of new mitochondria in the cell, maybe we can upregulate the production of mitochondria to a degree where we can overcome the deficit of energy that these patients are having because their mitochondria are not functioning well. And you mentioned something really, really important, which is that the mitochondria function with the support of two sets of genes. And it's the only organelle in the cell that has this situation. All the, you know, all the parts of the cell are controlled by the genes in the nucleus of the cell. But in the case of mitochondria, the mitochondria also have their own genes unique to the mitochondria. So in order for a mitochondria to function, it needs to have functioning mitochondrial genes but there are also about 2,000 nuclear genes in the nucleus of the cell that help support the function of the mitochondria as well. So what is interesting is this, is that patients who have a mitochondrial gene defect, a, gene of the, a defect in the genes of the mitochondria, not of the nucleus, the, by way in which the mitochondria divide in the cell, these patients often end up having what is called heteroplasmy, which means that within the same cell, if there are a thousand or two thousand mitochondria, let's say, some of those mitochondria will have a mutation that impairs the ability of that mitochondria to function, but some of the, of the mitochondria may not have the mutation and they are wild type normal functioning. So within a same cell, there is a proportion of mitochondria that are affected and a proportion that are not affected. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. typically, in order to manifest symptoms, in order to have the symptoms of a disease, a whole lot of mitochondria need to be affected. So if you can improve the numbers of mitochondria that are not affected, you can probably improve the function of the cell as well. And in fact, you can, it's been proven. So in, 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 in laboratory studies, it has been shown that if you put, cultivate a, a cell that has mutated mitochondria with mutated, you know, mitochondrial genes and it's not function, that cell doesn't produce enough energy. If, if, you, if, if you grow that cell and you add a little bit of PPAR delta there, you can increase the production of energy in the form of ATP, and that can improve the function of the cell as well. So, so, so there is evidence that that can happen. And that's why we thought, well, a PPAR delta could really help these patients because uh, in adults with PMM, the majority of them, about 80% of them, they have mitochondrial gene defects. They don't have nuclear gene defects. Okay. The nuclear gene defects are far more common in children. So we know that these adults have normal mitochondria and if we can upregulate the function of those normal mitochondria, we can produce more energy in the cell and, and that may result in the patients doing better from a clinical perspective. 
So that's the, the idea about using a PPAR delta agonist in patients with PMM, because we know that their main problem is that they are not able to produce enough energy because they have mutated mitochondria, but they also have normal mitochondria. And if we can upregulate that function, we can uh, 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 hopefully demonstrate that we can improve the function of the cells. Mm -hmm. And the cells that we're in mostly interested, but, uh, uh, so there is an in other important aspect of the PPAR, the agonists, that our body has three types of PPAR agonists. Our body has PPAR alpha, gamma, and delta agonists. Mm -hmm. They are relatively similar, but they have some differences. And in, in one of the main differences is where they are present. For example, the PPAR alpha and gamma are more present in the fat tissue and in the liver and in the spleen and in the organs that generate a lot of energy. Whereas the PPAR delta, which is the one we are uh, using now, is more present in all the other tissues in the body, primarily, importantly, in the muscles, uh, where, which are one of the areas that are most affected in patients with PMM. So the question is, well, could you use a PPAR that stimulates all three receptors? And the problem, there is one of those PPARs available, and it's not approved in the US, it's approved in Europe. But the concern that people have is that in order to generate enough stimulation of the PPAR delta, you probably have to stimulate a, role, a lot, the alpha and the gamma as well. And that may create more side effects if you mm. stimulate all the receptors at, at the same time at a very high level. And before we get into some of the, the clinical experience, separate for us, because you, know, you, you mentioned the primary mitochondrial myopathies, and then you also have uh, the, the program on, on these uh, long-chain fatty acid oxidation disorders, obviously through PPR, Delta, you know, I, I see the, the, the pharmacologic connection there, but talk about these two conditions because the, I mean, one seems like it's a lot, I mean, you know, the, the, in terms of liver dysfunction and cardiomyopathy and, and all that in terms of the long-chain fatty acid disorders, while the other seems like it's, much more skeletal muscle weak. I, explain these two conditions because they're they're yeah, obviously so, rare conditions, but they're unique. Yeah. So fatty acid oxidation defects are what we call inborn errors of metabolism. Yeah. So babies are born with a defect in the way they break down fats, and 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 you know. I, I, I don't know if 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 you recall from 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 biology, fats. Are, 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 are made of these chains of carbons that can be very long, medium mm -hmm. size, or very short. So we have short fats, medium sized fats, and large fats. Yeah. And for each of those fats, we have different enzymes that clip the carbons in the fat to generate energy. So you're removing carbons of that chain. And when you remove that carbon, the energy that is keeping that carbon bound is released, and that's what helps generate energy in the mitochondria. So you're processing the fatty acids that are long chains of carbons uh, to, to generate energy. And, and that's what we call the aerobic energy, the aerobic capacity, because you're using oxygen as you're breaking down the, the, the big fats. Yeah. And, and there are defects in the enzymes that break the long chain fatty acids, the medium chain fatty acids, or the little chain fatty acids. And what, what, what happens is this, typically uh, the most common of these defects, I think it has to do with breaking down the medium chain fatty acids. But if you cannot bring the break down the medium chain fatty acids, but you can break down the large fatty acids, generally the disease tend to be less severe. So the, the patients with medium chain fatty acid disorders, where they're missing the enzymes of the medium chain, which are the most common, often have some symptoms, but not very severe symptoms. Mm. Now, the ones that have a problem in the long chain fatty acid breakdown, those tend to have very severe symptoms. So the problem is this, if you recall, when we start using energy, we use first phosphocreatine very quickly, then we use glycogen, 
But when the glycogen, which is sugar, is depleted, your body mostly depends on the breakdown of fatty acids. Mm -hmm. So break, fatty acids are typically broken down in two conditions, uh, which are conditions where you've depleted the glucose, but you still need to break down, you, you know, need energy. Right. So right. if you're fasting, if you're fasting throughout the night, you know, after dinner, you mostly use glycogen. But as the glycogen gets depleted and you go to sleep, your body mostly depends on fatty acid oxidation, on breaking down the long chain fatty acids as a source of energy while you're asleep and fasting. Likewise, if you're running a marathon in the first two or three, four, five, six minutes, you're using phosphocreatine and glucose, but you quickly deplete that because you're exercising and you're mostly depending now on fatty acid breakdown or fatty acid oxidation to generate energy. So in those two conditions, when you're exercising a lot, or if you're fasting, you need long chain fatty acids. So it became apparent that some babies were born and when they were breastfeeding every two hours, they're getting enough glucose, sugar from the mother in the formula to, to, to turn around. But remember a baby when they turn four, five, six months old, they start spreading the, the, at night the feedings and mm. they start sleeping more hours at night. So what they realize is some of these babies are running into serious trouble when they sleep longer hours and no one knew why. And what it is is, and then some of these babies actually even died at night because they didn't have enough energy to survive. And they had this, what we call creep dead or sudden infant death. Mm -hmm. And many of these cases were because they had fatty acid oxidation defects. So while they were breastfeeding two, every two hours, there was no problem. But as the mother was starting to space out the breathing, the feedings at night, suddenly they were running into trouble. So that's why now we include in neonatal screening these defects. We want to see if, when babies are born, if they have one of those defects, because if you have one of those defects, you cannot stop feeding every two hours. You have to feed throughout the night. So we actually sometimes put a little tube into the baby and feed them during the night so that they don't run out of energy and they don't run into trouble. So the fatty acid oxidation defects are very specific mitochondrial defects where you cannot break down the large fats Yes. And you run into trouble in periods when you have increased energy demand. And the problems that these babies have change with time. When they are babies, they tend to have a lot of metabolic problems because the energy, when the baby is growing, there is a high demand for energy. You know, babies, are, babies duplicate their weight in three months and quadruple their weight in six months. So that requires a lot of energy. Yeah. And, and these babies run out of energy and they run into serious trouble. They get really sick. If they are able to survive that period, they tend to have more problems with the heart and with the muscles. And then as they get older, the muscle problem, the heart problem is not as big and the muscle problem becomes more pro pro problematic, similar to what happens to the patients with PMM. Now, the patients with PMM have a different set of problems. So you remember we talked about nuclear and mitochondrial genes. Sure. If you have a mitochondria, if you have a nuclear gene, all your mitochondria are affected and often the disease can manifest very early and can be very severe, even more severe than the fatty acid oxidation defects because all aspects of the mitochondria may be affected as opposed to only the processing of the large chains. So for example, in the patients with, with fatty acid oxidations that have a defect in the large chains, you can supplement their diet with medium chain triglycerides with MCT yeah. oil. Yeah. And that makes up for the lack of large fats. It doesn't completely solve the problem, but it decreases the problem significantly. It improves significantly the, the outcome of those babies. And in the patients with PMM, you cannot do that because the, the defect is more, more broad in the mitochondria. So giving them MCT doesn't help very much these patients. 
And the, the, what typically happens is if you have a nuclear defect, the patients present earlier in life. If you have a mitochondrial gene defect, they present later in life. But typically, the tissues that are affected are the tissues that require more energy. So your mm -hmm. heart, your muscles, your brain, the right. gastrointestinal symptoms that are constantly working are the tissues that get most affected in these patients. Perfect. Perfect. I appreciate you outlining all that. Um, now, that being said, um, we've gone over the pharmacology and the conditions. Talk about uh, Mavadelpar. I know... Uh, you know, this is your lead candidate. Uh, you've had some very successful phase one work going on in both uh, PMN and um, the long chain LCFAOD. Um, what have you experienced? I, obviously, you, you've seen great safety and tolerability, um, obviously some efficacy already uh, because of the unique nature of these patients. But um, what, 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 what have you what have you what have you seen in the last couple of years? You've been, uh, oh, so we did a study in patients with PMM. And we treated, it was an open label study. We treated for 12 weeks with the medicine. The mm -hmm. patients took the medicine every day for 12 weeks. And we looked at before and after outcomes in those patients. And we used a, a unique test. We used a 12 minute walk test. Okay. Now, people have heard mostly about six minute walk tests. So the question that always rises is why did you use a, six, a 12 instead of a six? If you recall, I mentioned that patients with PMN, their main problem is they don't manage energy supply through metabolism of fats very well. And that doesn't happen in the first four, five, six minutes of a test. That happens after you've depleted the, the glycogen around five, six minutes of the test. So you want to have a longer test so that you can capture the period of time when the muscles are mostly relying on fats as a source of energy, because that's what's affected in PMM patients. So that's why we chose a 12 minute walk test. So when we did the test, these patients at baseline were not able to walk in the 12 minute walk test very far. A mm. normal individual can walk about 1400 meters. These patients were able to walk only about 600 meters, which is less than half the distance a normal individual can walk. Mm. And when we, after 12 weeks of treatment, we saw an improvement of 100 meters, which is pretty whopping in distance. Yeah. I mean, it's a whole football field that, that, that they improved in the distance they were able to walk. But what was more impressive is that the improvement happened primarily in the second half of the test when we anticipated that that's when you would want to see the improvement because that's what's affected in these patients. And we didn't tell these patients, please walk faster in the second half of the test. They did it. And they did it probably because we might have improved their ability to generate energy in that second half of the test by upregulating the function of the mitochondria. We also ask patients about symptoms and we use several questionnaires. We use the SF36 that has an energy fatigue subscale. We also uh, use the modified fatigue impact scale. And in those scales, we saw la a large improvement of about 10, 11 points in each of those tests in terms of uh, the patients improving in, in, in their symptom of fatigue. And we saw a slight reduction also in, in pain as well in the patients uh, after 12 weeks of treatment. Altogether, that data uh, was very reassuring to us. By the way, we asked a few patients, we asked the patients on a voluntary basis if they would allow us to biopsy their muscles before and after treatment to see what changes we can find there. And, and there were seven patients that allow us to do that test. Uh, mm -hmm. It was voluntary. Uh, we knew that not all patients would want to have a, ma a muscle biopsy done because it can be painful and bothersome. But in those seven patients that we did the biopsy, we saw that we increase the, the function of the genes involved in, in mitochondrial function that are regulated by the, by, by, by the PPAR delta receptor. So, so th what that made a nice connection. You First, you upregulate these genes that you expect to upregulate. Then you can see improvements in the function of the patients. They're able to walk better uh, and, and, and they feel better as well. So based on that, we designed a phase, uh, a pivotal trial that is, uh, that, that, that finished, uh, 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 completed in, in October, and now we're just finishing cleaning up the data, and the data will be available in December, and and that will be the, the study that that if if it is. 
positive, if the results are adequate and, and positive, we would go to the FDA and to the European Commission and, and, and tell them, look, this is, these are the results of the study. On the basis of this study, uh, we want to get the drug approval so that the drug can be given to these patients. So together with that, we've also followed patients for safety for a long period of time, and we have a good safety database that we will be presenting as well. So, you know, when you want a drug approved, you have to demonstrate several things. You need, first, you need to demonstrate the quality of your product. Sure. You need to show that whatever you're giving to the patients is, 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 has good quality. Second, you, you, you want to demonstrate that it works, that it has efficacy. But also, you want to demonstrate that it's safe. So yeah. all those three aspects of, 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 of a drug approval are very important. And we're working really hard to put together the package to go, be able to go to the FDA. So, by the way, we've, we've discussed with the FDA what we would give them as the evidence. So we're very excited about this. We're, we're in the final stretch of cleaning everything up and, and, and being able to look at the results. And, and I, I, I think our guidance is that, that, that we will be reporting on those results by the end of the year. And, and we're very excited because if the results are positive, this would be the first drug that would be approved for the treatment of patients with PMM in the world. There is no other, there are no drugs approved for these patients and it could make a big difference for these patients. Absolutely. No, it's it's amazing how how, how uh, quickly in, in you've come with this. So it's not it's it's, it's very impressive. Um, actually, you know, we talked at the beginning of sort of the the unique nature of um, these diseases and and how you develop the clinical trials and 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 obviously recruiting patients. Um, say a couple. Of words. I know there's a there's a a piece on um, uh, the Renee website about expanded access, and obviously, you know. This is a expanded access is a tough topic everywhere, whether you're developing, you know, drugs for Alzheimer's disease or extremely rare genetic disorders. But any, any unique experiences or, um, you know, any stories you can relate to us per how expanded access um, or how you can utilize or expanded access uh, in, in sort of this rare orphan clinical development world because obviously you know the dynamics are as you pointed out earlier quite different with this population um any any interesting insight for expanded access and rare diseases sure, sure. so the, the very basics the very basics yeah. you you you, uh, you were very kind in your introduction and one of the things you mentioned is that i i, I I'm, I'm still i still see patients and and just in general terms, as a physician, I would say this, when you're giving, there is no free lunch in medicine. In other words, sure. whenever you give a medicine or whenever you do an intervention of any kind, there are unintended consequences of that treatment. Whatever treatment you can think of, the simplest treatment, aspirin, it irritates your stomach, you know? So, so yeah, it's a great drug, but it does irritate your stomach. So, and that's the simplest treatment. Uh, 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 you know, the more complicated treatments have really very serious side effects. So you always want to make a decision to treat on the basis of what I would call the risk benefit profile of a drug. Sure. You know, how much are you gonna benefit and how much are you risking? And the problem with a drug like, like Mopodelpar is that because we don't have enough experience with that drug today, we, it's very difficult to establish clearly the risk benefit profile of the drug. Once we get the results of the trial, we can address the benefit. Sure. So it's very difficult to open an EAP, an expanded access program, before you've completed your one trial where mm -hmm you can demonstrate the efficacy because then there is a lot of risk that you know about, but you don't know anything about the benefit. So how do you make that decision? So we will be in a very good position to be able to make that judgment when we complete the trial and if we see positive results. If we see positive results, then we know this is a drug that can potentially help patients. And, and therefore, 
it, we know that there is a protracted period, even though with orphan diseases, you can get a drug approved a little bit faster than with regular drugs. Then you have to make a decision. Do I make the drug available to patients while we are waiting for the full approval? Because in my mind, patients have contributed significantly to the success of this drug. Many of the patients have put themselves at risk in participating in the studies. Some of them probably knowing that they may not benefit from the drug, but in the long run, but that it may benefit others to help to in, 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 in their life. Like for example, when the phase one studies were done, those were done with healthy volunteers that we, they knew they were not going to take this medicine. They don't have a disease to treat, but they still participated in those phase one trials so that patients can eventually receive the drug. We owe it to everyone to make the drug available to patients as fast as we can. Mm -hmm. And the only thing we're waiting for in our uh, efficacy trial, mm -hmm. When you do an EAP, you also gather some safety data and that may be beneficial because the more safety data you ben you, 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 you gather, the, the, the better we will be at, at strengthening that risk benefit profile. When drugs first get approved, um, they get approved like a regular drug may be approved on the basis of up to 2000 patients treated. But sometimes you're treating millions of people Right. So imagine all that data that gets collected after the drug may becomes available that will help inform whether a drug has or doesn't have side effects. And, 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 and sometimes you learn things that are beneficial and sometimes you think, learn things that are not necessarily beneficial and that you have to be cautious about. So an EAP allows you, while the drug is being approved, to gather more data on safety that can be better and more reassuring to the patients when they are ready to use the drug. So we want to open an EAP as soon as possible. And, and, and we're working really hard as we speak to have that in queue. And if the results of the trial are positive, the ELP will open very quickly so that we can give access to the patients and collect more safety data. Really excellent. While I have you, I just have to ask because you know we're in the um, in the current era of of the GLP one receptor agonists uh, looking like sort of super blockbuster products that are going to make the you know the the Lipitors of the world and the monoclonals look like nothing in terms of <laughs> the the indications that are going to be coming online for these products. Now, obviously, you're working in rare diseases, but clearly, cellular bioenergetics, mitochondrial function. Um, they impact a lot more than the rare diseases. And I was just, you know, as you sit around and, and brainstorm sometimes, you just think about, I mean, um, do you envision sort of other, uh, the application of drugs that improve cellular bioenergetics like yours or other ones that you may be developing for a variety of these other metabolic conditions that, you know, are worth lots of billions of dollars today. <laughs> Market. Not only not only for that, not only for that, but but you know, a byproduct, a byproduct of the a progress that we've had in medicine, and we've had tremendous advances in cardiology and in right. cancer. Right? We we've had tremendous advances. So as a consequence, we're living much longer years than we uh, uh, were living before. Yeah. So 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 I think that as we age, one of the big problems we have with with elderly people is they're losing muscle mass. They're yeah. losing, I mean, and it's not entirely clear. This is a condition called sarcopenia, for example. Yep. And, and, and we're not entirely sure why this happens, a lack of mobility, other medicines they're taking. Maybe there are, we know that as you age, your mitochondria naturally mutate. And right. they become less efficient. So, so there is the belief that if you can, if if we're going to live longer years, we're going to have to sus, sus, support mitochondrial function yep. through those longer years, and we're going to have to find ways to preserve the mitochondria to 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 continue to meet the demands of the body in terms of energetics. So, I see a huge field for mitochondrial biology, especially. Uh, as we are developing an aging population in the world. Uh, I think that, that 
that will, you know, it is like a rejuvenating factor, an yeah. important rejuvenating factor. So I see a lot of opportunity. I think that mitochondrial biology is essential. And when you look at many diseases, I mean, there is a there are papers that 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 that, that show mitochondria an interplay between mitochondrial function and neuro 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 uh, degenerative diseases yep. as well. Yep. So so for example, there is a paper on 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 the function of PIPAR delta in in, in uh, that that we saw from a very reputable researcher. In my in mitochondrial biology, looking at 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 the uh, at the uh, 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 you know one of the neurodegenerative diseases, and and I think that that uh, we may be able to have an effect. I mean, I mean, I think those are a group of diseases that are coming up that are one of the biggest problems we have. You know, dealing with Alzheimer's, with oh, yeah. dealing with all these de neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, Parkinson's, they're, 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 they're very big problems that we have right now and that we've had trouble addressing. And the mitochondria have some 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 uh, crucial role in in all of those processes. So I I and I, I foresee that the, the better understanding of mitochondrial biology and better interventions to improve mitochondrial function are going to be important targets for many diseases in the near future. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because you know we we've we've talked about metophagy on the show and sort of the, the recycling of mitochondria and then obviously some of the genetic engineering stuff. But again, what you're pointing out here, you know, the ability to uh, to impact via sort of traditional small molecules and this cellular, bi cellular bioenergetics, it, uh, it it's quite far reaching. I'm going to enjoy. Um, not just following your company um, and your progress on rare diseases, but I think <laughs> this is going to go in many other directions as well. So it's going to be, uh, I hope we have the opportunity to uh, to do a follow-up episode uh, on where all this goes. Um, Alex, while, while we have you, anything that I missed, uh, any anything coming up as we get close to 2024 beyond the, the pivotal uh, study and the analysis uh, conferences or talks or uh, other initiatives where we could uh, listen to you or run into you, uh, anything else on your calendar that you want to mention, please? Well, I'll tell you, for the next eight weeks or so, I'm buried looking at, at, at getting all the data ready for, for, the, for, for, the, for the readout of the trial. Uh, I think we have a schedule to go to one of the, 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 the bank uh, meetings in, 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 in New York, but, but that's too, very close to the time when the data will become available. So I don't know if that will happen or not. So we're pretty much in, in what I would call hibernation right now oh, yeah. uh, to, to get the, the, the work done and, 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 and see the results of the trial. And, and okay. I, I think that if the results are positive, then we will have a lot of work to do in building the infrastructure that we need to build uh, to really have a successful launch. You know, uh, 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 there is no value in a drug that is out there that people are not using. I, sure. I, 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 to me, the important thing will be to, uh, if the results are positive for this trial, we, the important thing will be to uh, education themselves can decide jointly with the doctors whether this is the right drug for them or not. Absolutely. I believe in this this concept of shared decision making. You know, so I, I think it's very important in, in the relationship between doctors and patients that that all perspectives are addressed. You know, the the perspective of the patient, the, the perspective of the doctor, the advantages and disadvantages, because I think that each individual is unique in in what their needs are and what their hopes and expectations for treatment are. And uh, so it's important to share in that decision. Absolutely. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And um, uh, again, um, for our audience, everybody that's uh, going to be listening to uh, this episode of our show across the various podcast networks, watching on our YouTube channel. Again, you've been listening to Dr. Alejandro Dorenbaum, Chief Medical Officer, Reneo Pharmaceuticals, doing really amazing things uh, for developing these therapies for patients with rare genetic diseases, rare mitochondrial disorders. Um, Alex, I, again, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come and educate 
educate us on all these teams for a little while. Obviously, thank you for what you do. And as we like to say on our show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for many people via what you do. Really great story. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.